So a patient with long-standing ileocecal disease, Crohn's disease develops pain in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen and the right flank. There is no nausea or vomiting. And the patient's been on maintenance medical therapy. We're going to make the assumption that it's appropriate medical therapy. Uh, the most likely cause of the symptom complex is, uh, as you see. Interesting. Half and half. Usually what happens is, is that in pain that develops in Crohn's disease out of proportion without intestinal obstruction, that is without the nausea and vomiting, is usually a sign of development of fistulous disease. Uh, usually, although I can see where some of the other things could be uh, uh, misconstrued. So we'll have, to, we'll have to work on that one. Next. Or is there one more? Yes, I think there is. Hand assist laparoscopic resection. Um, has yielded results similar to straight laparoscopic resection in several publications. High BMI, phlegma, and abscess are good indications. Placement of the hand port is extremely important to have optimal visualization. For total proctocolectomy, the best place to put the hand port is Tom, you don't have to answer that. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Marcello, you agree with that? In my, in my practice, yes. There you go. Okay. Uh, is there one more for the, uh, one more, yes. Yes, okay. So the best preoperative evaluation of small bowel to determine the presence of strictures, their relationship with the rest of the intestine and the residual length of intestine is? Yeah, now the radiologist, I think, nowadays may argue that point a little bit. Uh, they, with the reconstitution to make your x-ray, your CT scan look exactly like a small bowel series, uh, will, will tell you that they think they can do exactly the same job. And they're probably right. I think that a lot of the uh, way we feel about it from a surgical perspective is that we like to see, actually see this relationship. Uh, we see it a little bit better with uh, contrast study, but I'm not so sure that I think that's probably going to change rel relatively soon. Um, and I think that's it for the first set. Is that correct? I think. Yeah, no, that's for the second set. Okay, so um, I'd like to know, uh, we're going to start a question and answer. We can take that off. And we're going to start a question and answer uh, period. We're right, we're right on time. And hopefully we'll have something from the, uh, uh, our friends down south uh, in, in if there are any questions. Um, if there are any questions, please come to the microphone and, and ask and introduce yourself. Yes? Catherine Chu, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Salky, I very much enjoyed your talk on the um, fistulas. And I was just wondering, when you do divide the fistula tract for the innocent bystander, either the duodenum or the sigmoid or the bladder, how are you closing that defect? Are you able to use a stapling device for all of those? Are you doing intracorporeal suturing? Could you address that? You know, well, it depends. Um, I prefer the stapler because it's just easier from a technical point of view. But as you know well, sometimes that's just not possible if it's a, if it's a large one. Uh, so, and I think that brings into uh, uh, a question of why, uh, if you're going to do advanced laparoscopic, why you need to have suturing skills. I mean, you really need to have them in order to close the holes that you can't use with a stapler. So the answer is that the preference is a stapler, but Many times we have to hand sew the hole, uh, and that's what we'll do. Whatever way you do it, though, I'll tell you, you better check it intraoperatively to make sure that you've done it uh, well. Barry, can I add one thing to that? What would you do in the, in the sigmoid colon? Do you make sure they always have a colonoscopy beforehand, and if the sigmoid has some disease, what, what would be your practice or preference? Yeah, um, we do colonoscopies on 100% of the patients who have uh, ileocecal disease. Uh, if they have disease in the uh, sigmoid, it depends on what you're operating for, but by and large, we're going to resect the sigmoid at the same time, so it's going to be a double resection. And of course, that will bring into uh, question whether or not they're going to get a temporary diversion. Temporary diversions, we sort of, uh, you'll get a variety of different opinions depending on which type of patient you're operating on, what their nutritional status is, what medications they're on, all those things. 
I, I would say that uh, just in general, if you have any doubt whatsoever what those look like, you should divert the patient uh, and then uh, get a, a weld healed and anastomosis of both sides. I don't know how they think about that. I mean, I think for elective surgery, if you're truly planning your operation correctly, you should be able to do a, a double segmental resection safely without a stoma. But, you know, again, you have to judge what the patient looks like, mostly nutritionally. You know, it, it's clearly a judgment call. I mean, the, the way the anastomosis looks at the end, the nutritional status, the amount of inflammation. Um, I probably use more stomas than I should just to uh, sleep well at night, but uh, it's a judgment call every, uh, every case you do. I have a question for Dr. Fabian, a question about uh, infleximab and obstruction, or the use of this drug and whether or not there really is a higher incidence of obstruction uh, after the use of this drug medication. Right. I, I, I don't think we have the answer to that, uh, number one. Um, so so the, the issue is there, there is older data about the incidence of obstruction on infleximab. Most of us feel that our medical doctors that use it is, was the selection of patients. Um, obviously, if you take a patient with a fibrotic stricture uh, and treat them with infliximab, um, you're not going to relieve that obstruction. Uh, and many of those patients ultimately go to surgery. Um, I, I use, I use uh, infliximab and, and now other anti-TNF agents um, in patients with have, that have inflammatory uh, disease and minimal obstructive symptoms, um, you know, like the three cases I presented. Question. Thanks, Steve White from Australia. Question for uh, Pete Marcello, who I always, in, always enjoy your talks, Pete. It's um, a couple of comments again. Um, in the case of a difficult left-sided uh, colonic resection, and you're preferring a um, fan and steel hand-assisted approach, I've got a few things. In a big, big male, it's not a hand that you've got in there; it's your whole arm, isn't it? Um, comment. Second, second thing is. In a two or a three hour case, um, surely it's, I can't imagine how exhausting it must be for the guy to have his hand trapped in there that whole time. And thirdly, um, I can't quite picture it, if you're standing on the patient's right and you're a right-handed surgeon, how, who's got their hand in the belly? It can't be you it, if, if you're operating with your right hand. Good question. So the first one, if you have somebody really tall, and I've done up to 6'6 six, six with the fan and steel, uh, I purposely do not exercise my right forearm so that the size of my forearm stays the size of your hand. And it's very few people that have a forearm much more massive than the size of their hand. So uh, reach has not been an issue uh, for me at this stage. But, you know, certainly you may need to consider it. You the must be up to your elbow sometimes. Though. You're up, you're up yeah. into your forearm, certainly, yeah. uh, in certain cases. And, and you may then say, well, should I use a fan steel or a lower midline? And I think, you know, you sort of do what's comfortable. If you have to convert uh, from a fan steel, you can actually convert, make a big midline and close it up. And, and I've had that happen in, in rare cases, too. And they both healed. Second question was about feeling like trapped. Well, in point of fact, most of the time uh, I'm, I'm teaching with residents, so nobody has their hand in for two plus hours. But think about an open operation. You have your hand in the colon, working on the colon for two hours, open. And most of the devices today don't really, you know, crimp up your arm tremendously uh, during the case. And there are different parts of the procedure where your hand is, right hand is in, and maybe other times the left hand is in. And, and yes, I actually have, when I'm working on the pedicle, I have my right hand in, and my left hand is buzzing with an instrument. And I am a right-handed surgeon. But if you cannot buzz with your left hand, with your other hand inside, I don't think you should be doing a laparoscopic colectomy. You've got to be able to use both hands. I'm not asking your non-dominant hand to do tremendous work. I'm asking you to buzz and brush. And if you can't do that with your left hand, I'm not sure that you should be doing open, laparoscopic, straight laparoscopic, or hand-assisted. So that's my method. Yeah. Question. Jean-Pierre Gagné from Laval University in Quebec. For Dr. Marcello, we're not able yet to fully appreciate all the benefits and all the working uh, process of laparoscopy. From a purely scientific standpoint, isn't there a mistake to assume that the only benefit of laparoscopy relates to the length of the incision? Just putting the hand in maybe gives more inflammation, more adhesions, or other effects that we cannot appreciate now? That's a very good question. I can answer sort of the second part because I, at the ASCRS meeting this year, 
I'll present our data on adhesion formation following laparoscopic total colectomy and proctal colectomy. And in that series, there was almost equal numbers of straight lap and hand assisted. And when we closed the ileostomy after doing a pouch, we actually put the camera inside and assessed prospectively adhesion formation. And the interesting thing is that they, those with the hand or without, it didn't seem to make a difference in terms of adhesion formation. And you're absolutely true. I think the benefit is the size of the incision. And so when you talk about a left colectomy, you're talking about a, a five or six versus eight. And maybe the, I think advantage of a true fan and steel is that if you go sideways through the fascia, that when you close, you're not putting stitches in the muscle. So that in our study, there wasn't a difference in pain or narcotic usage. So therefore, maintaining some of the benefits. And, and again, it's not a, a, a always or a must. It's just a tool for the toolbox that may help you. Let me just ask a question for the audience. You can just uh, raise your hand. How many people use the hand assist approach preferentially now? So pretty small. Yeah. Well, let me ask it the other way. How many people in the audience preferentially use straight laparoscopic surgery? Isn't that interesting? Is that the, what is the penetration rate from a company's perspective? It's actually the audience, this audience is a little bit skewed probably, but I think it depends on the procedure. Like an iliocolic resection, uh, my hand would be straight lap, you know, and there are other rectopexy, you know, straight lap. So I think it's just a matter of, uh, of what you do and what you're comfortable with. And if you don't, it, it, there is a learning curve with it. It's not like I can say you can do a hand always and make a, a novice into an expert. So. Interesting. And actually, if the, our uh, internet audience, I'd love to get a, an idea outside the United States uh, of if the, what the percentage of people who are doing hand assist. So if someone from some other country could give me some information on that and post it over here on the uh, web, I would really appreciate that. There's a question back there. Yeah, uh, Petahia Reisman from uh, Jerusalem, Israel. We run a, a fairly large IBD center and uh, about the issue of capsule endoscopy in patients with Crohn's in suspected stricture, we've learned the lesson that you never use the real capsule on these patients. There is a test capsule that you should use mm -hmm. and only if the patient is passing the test capsule, only then you would use the real capsule and then you can get all the information without any risk. Thanks. Is that, yeah, a no, is that a question, Professor Reisman, or that's a That was a comment. <laughs> you know, as I said, we, uh, as surgeons, we see the one that gets stuck. Uh, there are um, many gastroenterologists out there that are doing exactly what, uh, what you're saying. Unfortunately, recently, uh, I've seen several of those coming with the little uh, bean stuck in the small bowel. So it, it's, uh, your point is well taken. I've got, I've got an x-ray of one actually with that they sent another capsule down to dock with it so there's two stuck in the in the stricture. And to, fo to follow up on that as well, um, Ed Loftus and one of our fellows looked at at multiple different imaging modalities for small bowel Crohn's disease and found that uh, that with CT enterography uh, it all depends on what what you do at your institution as well. If you're looking at just small bowel x-ray, the capsule did seem to have some uh, diagnostic benefit um, to small bowel x-ray. But if you look at CT enterography, um, the capsule really didn't add very much. So if, you're, if, if it's a diagnostic study looking for active Crohn's disease, um, it, it may not add a lot of value to what we have currently available in many institutions anyway. We, I mean, we don't use a lot of capsule for small bowel Crohn's. Let me ask uh, the, uh, the uh, panel a question here about steroids, stress doses of steroids after laparoscopic surgery. Have you noticed that you've needed it, not needed it? Can the patients be back on their same steroid dosage level with laparoscopic as, appears to, as compared to doing an open uh, approach? And Peter, have you noticed any difference whatsoever in doing, using a hand approach on people who are on steroids? Any difference in terms of their steroids postoperative? Anybody wants to answer that? Uh, no, I've not been uh, uh, brave enough to, uh, to try that approach, uh, you know, if you think about it, it, it does make sense and, and probably we should, we should try in the uh, selected patients that have not been on steroids for years. Um, so you, sh you give stress doses? I do, I do the same, yes. Everybody gets stress doses? Yeah, I, I mean, I, the data is not very strong anyways for the whole stress dose uh, phenomenon, but I think I do exactly the same as open and I start my wean sooner, so whatever they come in on, they get their stress dose perioperatively for laparoscopic. They'd be oral the next day at 50% their admission dose, and then a taper from there as an outpatient. I'm pretty happy I asked the question. I'll tell you why in a second. Go ahead, Bill. Or I would Peter. say for us, we, we do use them. I think we use too much. 
uh, and so but we're all afraid of not using it. So, for, for what it's worth, there is very little data, but it's about nine months or so off steroids before, for whatever, it's, for whatever it's worth, the little literature there is about nine months off before somebody might feel comfortable not using stress doses. I, I don't use any stress doses after laparoscopic surgery. Whatever, sur whatever dose they were on preoperatively, that is what they're on by mouth postoperatively without a stress dose. And I found that that absolutely was zero problem, zero problem, and it's been a real benefit for the patient and having, not having to uh, bump up their steroids and bring them down slowly. It's been really a benefit of laparoscopic approach. I guess I'm, I mean, so you, they just take the oral dose the day before surgery or what? Correct. I mean, yeah. They uh, get a stress dose, I'm going to actually explain. At the time of surgery, they get a stress, they get 100 milligrams of hydrocortisone. Yeah. Postoperatively, they get no other steroid except their normal dosage, which they take by mouth. I do basically the same thing, except 50 percent of what they came in on. Sorry, some more questions. Joe Dodd, Toledo, Ohio. Uh, for Don't the go away in the back. I've got, you're still going to get your chance in about two seconds. <laughs> One more question. Go ahead. No, no, no. In front first. Oh, okay. Uh, for the panelists, when, for your patients on steroids, are you bothering to give vitamin A, uh, trying to counteract the effects of steroids on wound healing, or is that important in laparoscopy or just open surgery, or cover all your bases? I give it, but with absolutely no scientific direction on how much, how long. It seems fairly homeopathic as long as they don't overdose on it. Yeah, we don't, we don't give it. Yeah, no, we don't give it either. It, it, this is an interesting discussion here. Uh, for example, we keep our patients on 6MP or Imuran to, to the day of surgery. So we really have a completely different way of, of managing patients post-op. It would be a great uh, discussion, maybe more with, uh, with our gastroenterology colleagues. But no, we do not use vitamin A now. Last question. Uh, okay. <coughs> Fezzo Ramsey from Cleveland Clinic. The question that I have uh, regarding the hand assist versus the pure laparoscopy the opinion from the surgeons. When you come to these meetings more and more, the courses that you see is more uh, hand assist courses. Uh, I wonder uh, whether is this a society's position on these ones? The courses will be just pure hand assist. Is there a place still for laparoscopy for us to teach our colleagues in the future for the pure laparoscopy approach? I wonder what's the panel's opinion on this. Thank you. Professor, you and I will have to fund the course because you can't get anybody to fund a pure laparoscopic course. Well, I, I guess the issue relates to adoption. So if I take a general surgeon in his practice who does 20 colon resections a year, which is what average is, the adoption rate when we taught the straight laparoscopic techniques was actually very low. And when we started introducing the hand as an option, the adoption rates went up to between 60 and 75 percent. That's what they tell us. In my own practice, I had uh, three partners who don't do any laparoscopy who started with a hand, and now I have a partner who did a woman with a BMI of 46, a straight right colectomy. Now, she would not have been able to do that had she not gone through the process. And this, for her, was a bridge or something that's beneficial. So I think there still is a role for straight laparoscopic surgery. But if you're trying to get into the game, we have to find a way to make it easier. It's not really the game for the residents. It's more for the game for the practicing surgeon uh, in this world. And so I think, uh, again, it's not a passion. It's not a religion. It's just an option and a tool in the toolbox for you. Thank you very much, everybody.